because I thought it was about weight. I thought it was about obesity. And lo and behold, more and more data coming out, it is not about obesity. And we kind of got sidetracked and we did a whole lot of work with genetics and cancer and found that really that's not the driving force. This is about mitochondrial health. This is about metabolism. Uh, and, and kind of shocking, I suppose, in the cancer world. Hi, Dr. Eric Westman here, and it's my great pleasure to be with Dr. Christy Kesslering. Hi, I'm Christy Kesslering, a radiation oncologist from the Chicagoland area. And as you may or may not know, nutrition plays an integral role in our cancer outcomes. So I am thrilled to announce that my new course, Metabolic Nutrition for Cancer, is now available. But enrollment is only open for a few days. You will find the link in the description below where you can learn more about the course. Her primary uh, interest and specialty is radiation oncology. You know, I wonder how did a radiation oncologist like you get into metabolic medicine? Yeah, I think that um, going way back, since I've actually followed a low carb diet for over 20 years, um, it, it first started with my own health issues, right? My own my own baby weights after having, you know, a number of children, uh, knowing that my family had, tends toward obesity. Um, but with time, I started seeing data kind of coming out that, oh, geez, look at obesity and cancer. Wow. And more and more cancers joined that um, uh, list. And as I started then counseling people on low carb diets just for weight loss, because I thought it was about weight. I thought it was about obesity. And lo and behold, more and more data coming out. It is not about obesity because we have many thin cancer patients. It really is insulin resistance, metabolic dysfunction, um, mitochondria. So our mitochondria in those cells, in, in our cells, which are our main, you know, ATP generator, but they do so much more than that. And, and it has been shown that cancer is likely a mitochondrial disease. And what we know actually is if we follow low carbohydrate ketogenic diets, we seem to improve that. That's great. And, you know, but, but your experience isn't enough, right? I mean, there had to be other other science, and um, which which is great. And I've heard other people then will go back to thinking about Otto Warburg, and it, what what's the the Warburg effect? Okay. So the Warburg effect essentially is uh, mitochondrial damage. So what he noted is that even though we talk about all of these other causes of cancer what happened or what he noted was that every cancer seemed to burn more sugar, that these granules, he called them, you know, these, they seem to be damaged and not working the same way in cancer cells. And so those cells used more and more and more glucose, like we would use in an anaerobic state. If we were doing a high intensity workout, you know, where our muscles start to burn, we generate lactic acid. He was seeing that these cells, even when there was oxygen plentiful, that they were burning glucose in this lactic acid pathway. And so these cells were creating more and more lactic acid. And there have, I would say shortly thereafter, right? Watson and Crick, we've got DNA, we started going down, it, it's everything's a genetic disease and we kind of got sidetracked and we did a whole lot of work with genetics and cancer and found that really that's not the driving force. There's so many different potential genetic variations in every cancer. And so Dr. Seafried and uh, Thomas Seafried at uh, Boston College and a few others actually have done some work looking at this idea of mitochondria, metabolism as the driver of cancers, not genes, uh, not genetics. I would say genes are still involved. We have mitochondrial genes. We also, when the mitochondria become damaged, they do send stress signals to the nucleus, which affect the nucleus. But what Dr. Seafried found is that if he transplanted 
a normal, uh, sorry, a, a damaged nucleus, so a, a cancerous cell's nucleus into a normal cell, if the genetic theory, you know, sustained, then those cells would also become cancer, but they didn't. They stayed normal. But if you took a normal nucleus and transplanted it into a cancer cell, replaced the damaged nucleus with this healthy nucleus, but that had damaged mitochondria and, you know, in theory, damaged cytoplasm, those cells became cancer. And those nuclei or the nucleuses, the nuclei, um, now looked abnormal again, right? So others have done studies where they transplanted normal, healthy mitochondria into cancer cells, and they've shown de decreased growth rates, improved efficiencies with chemotherapies. Um, really interesting stuff being done saying, gosh, this is about mitochondrial health. This is about metabolism. Yeah, Dr. Seyfried has a, a, a textbook, Yay Thick Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, and the, the work showing that it, the, if it was just the nucleus and DNA coming from the nucleus, not being the whole story, is remarkable and, and, uh, and, and kind of shocking, I suppose, in the cancer world. Most uh, specialists or scientists who are in the, the DNA and genetic paradigm probably don't want to embrace that. I don't even think they're aware of it most of the time. Like most of the time they just hear ketogenic diet, cancer, there's no data for that. That's what we hear over and over and over. In fact, not only is there no data for that, that is going to be dangerous, you know? And so I do, sadly, I counsel a lot of my patients when they're, then when they're talking to their conventional therapists, um, uh, or their conventional doctors, like go, just tell them that you've cut out processed food. Tell them that you've cut out sugars. Tell them that you're eating a real whole foods diet because that's what an optimal ketogenic diet is. Um, so it's, it, you shouldn't be afraid of saying I am eating, you know, meat and broccoli and spinach and, you know, whatever you're, you're choosing, but you're eating real food and you feel amazing. They always feel amazing when they switch to a nutrient dense, you know, and, and start burning fat for fuel. It's, it's amazing. The difference, um, sometimes within days, uh, sometimes it's, you know, within weeks, but most people will feel better or they'll feel like they're tolerating that next round of treatment better. You know, there was another, um, way that radiation oncologists kind of come to this field. And I've heard the story that they were sitting in front of scans that were labeled with FTG glucose oh. and it shows where the tumor is. But explain this, please. Yeah, yeah. So that is one, uh, one piece of the puzzle. So what we know from a PET scan is that we inject people with radio labeled glucose. What happens when we ingest uh, or, or take in a lot of glucose is that our pancreas secretes a bunch of insulin and insulin allows, or is like the, the key in a lock. It binds to insulin receptors so that the cell then opens the door to glucose and pulls glucose in and cancers again, which we just discussed need so much glucose to survive because they are running 100% in that anaerobic pathway, that glucose, glucose, glucose pathway that they need so much. And so those cancer cells that are the most metabolically active, most dependent upon glucose will become the brightest on a PET scan. Um, it's not a perfect answer because we're not, um, necessarily checking IGF-1 or other things, like they're all kind of interrelated. Um, we use different scans for different types of cancer, but that doesn't mean that they're not metabolically active. And we actually have data even in lower grade ERPR positive patients, which might not be as bright on a PET scan, but there still is some metabolic dysfunction. It's just not as dramatic. So even at even though at a cellular level, it's there, um, the PET scans really light up when it's, I mean, it's so obvious, right? 
Um, and when we look back in the data, guess what? There have been numerous studies where cancer cells have been stained for insulin receptors and stained for IGF-1 receptors, and they definitely upregulate or have far, far more receptors than our normal cells. So that is why normal cells tend not to uptake as much, so they're not bright like the cancer cells. So what's the best diet for cancer then? Mm -hmm or cancer prevention, or? Well, so in my world, I'm always recommending the diet in the patient that will lower insulin the best. So that is a ketogenic diet. It is, it, every time we compare a low fat to a ketogenic diet, a Mediterranean to a ketogenic diet, even a Mediterranean to a Mediterranean, but with beef, like if you really look at some of the data out there and you look at those metabolic markers, glucose, insulin, uh, uh, triglycerides, um, other things that are associated um, with insulin resistance, they all get better when we remove high fat, high carb foods. And every person is a little bit different. So they've actually done studies where they feed the exact same meal to a group of patients, and you can see the dramatic differences in what glucose um, might do after that meal. And so we know that dependent upon the underlying mechanism, so your underlying metabolism, your, your metabolic dysfunction, smaller amounts of carbohydrate can still drive big glucose and insulin surges. So it's really important to know what your numbers are and how are they changing with the diet you're choosing? So within the realm of ketogenic diets, as you're well aware, we, we can do more plant-based type ketogenic diets. We can do carnivore ketogenic diets. Most people choose to do kind of a nice omnivore type with some plants and some meats and eggs and fish. Um, some do pescatarian style. Uh, there's so many variations, but it's really about what is it doing to you? What is it doing to your metabolism? So, and when I say your metabolism, I'm not talking about how many calories you burn. I'm talking about, does it lower your fasting glucose? Does it lower your fasting insulin? Does it lower your IGF-1? Are we in optimal ranges? Um, and, and it's really easy actually to see on lab tests. Unfortunately, our conventional doctors are not ordering the proper tests. And even when they do, the reference ranges are so broad because they really are just measuring the average person walking into that lab. So they're not looking to see, okay, well, what is the data in cancer? We want those numbers, you know, low. We don't want them average. You know, so sometimes what you don't say is as important as what you do say. So you didn't say that there's just one type of diet a plant-based diet, an animal-based diet, a, a Mediterranean diet. You didn't, you didn't say that there's just one answer, one size fits all. Correct. There is no one size fits all. And everybody chooses to do things slightly differently. And, and some people need to do things differently. So I do have some people who want to follow X way of eating, but we see that it doesn't move their markers the way we need them to. And so we have to make changes. Um, but again, that's, that's why I love, you know, testing, like, don't just assume that the diet you have chosen is the right one for you without looking under the hood and knowing what it's doing. You, you really, um, may not be choosing the best one for you. And interestingly, we can't just judge it based on weight. I do have a lot of people who will start a ketogenic quote unquote ketogenic diet, and they will feel better and they will, um, you know, lose weight and some of their symptoms are getting better. But when we actually look at the numbers, they're not moving actually the way that we wanted them to. Um, and therefore we might need to adjust, get them into actually test, you know, are you actually in ketosis or are you just maybe slightly calorie restricted, which is okay too, but there, you know, I always go back to Dr. Fine's study. It was a very small study um, with only 10 patients, but the only intervention 
was a very low carb diet, but it was about 40 grams of carbohydrate per day, which was the recommended like eat 40 grams or less. We didn't track, I, I don't recall that he did any kind of um, diet assessment to say, were you eating less than 40? And, and if you were, how many, you know, how many grams of carbohydrate were you eating? But what it showed was that um, half of the patients had a had stable disease or improved disease with diet alone. The other half had progressive disease. And both groups of patients had equal weight loss. But it was the group that had higher ketones and change, a lowering of insulin. Again, I think ketones are just a surrogate that your insulin is maybe it's moving in the enough. right direction, right? Yeah. Um, it was those who lowered insulin that actually had stable or improved disease. And if your insulin went up, which some did, even though they were losing weight. So why is that exactly? I don't know. I'm sure it was just small numbers, but um, those that didn't reduce their insulin didn't get the benefit. So it's really about looking at the insulin. Yeah, and that's uh, Dr. Jean, Eugene Fine at SUNY Downstate in New York. Uh, I remember him presenting many years ago uh, on this, and um, so much uh, has to do with what's going on inside the body, not what the plate looks like, the colors, exactly. and things like that, and focusing um, on the internal metabolism. This yeah. Key. yeah. And and I do, you know, unfortunately, our, our conventional doctors and dietitians continue to recommend, you know, the the classic kind of Mediterranean style diet and, you know, avoid red meat and eat more plants. Um, and if you look on the national cancer, you know, level of evidence, it still says it is not based on evidence, but on expert opinion. So right. we go right back to the whole epidemiologic, you know, confounding factors and not looking at the available literature that we have that we need to be addressing metabolism. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Kesslering, uh, metabolic medicine specialist and radiation oncologist in the Chicago land area. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and check out adapterlifeacademy.com.